my wife Shaylin and I started one church. Uh, well, we moved there uh, 13 years ago. We did a year of pre-launch, uh, moved to the community, didn't know anybody. We, we didn't have any family. They didn't have any friends there. We just moved to Columbus because we felt that was where God was leading us to go. We wanted to be obedient. And uh, I went and I had to get a job. I actually worked three jobs. My wife worked two. I worked three. And um, uh, I had to get a job because the church didn't exist. And how many of you know churches that don't exist don't pay well? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it was a rough salary. Okay, rough. And so I, and my family likes to eat, so, so I went to get a job. And uh, I have a, a degree in theology. And it turns out the study of God, which is what theology is, the study of God. The study of God is not a marketable skill in the marketplace, I found out, because I put, <laughs> I put my resume all over town, and I couldn't get a job. No one would even call me back. And so um, I went and I found the community hub in our community was a, a fitness center that people from all over the city would come, actually 8,000 members. And so I wanted to get a job there. So I put in my resume. They would not call me back. So I decided to get aggressive. How many of you know there's a time to wait on God and there's a time to get to work, you know? So, so I show up at the gym uh, and I pretended to want a membership. <laughs> How many of you know when you show up ready to spend money, the important people come out. They're like, oh, can I help you? Can I help you? I'm like, yeah, well, did you get my resume? You know, but I didn't say any of that. I, I, I went covert. I acted like I wanted a, a membership, and I get halfway through the tour of the gym, and I just stopped the manager. I said, listen, I got to come clean. My name is Greg Ford. I'm here to plant a church in the city. And I said, what I need is a job. And I said, if you'll, if you'll hire me, I'll be the best employee that you've ever had. I said, I'll show up on time. I'll treat everybody with honor and respect. I said, you'll never have to uh, clean up one of my messes. I, I said, I tell you what, I'll learn as many names as I possibly can. He said, well, what do you want to do? I said, I want to work the front desk. I said, I want everybody that walks in this gym to have to walk past me. He said, you're hired. <laughs> he said, we've never had anybody that passionate about the front desk. So I got hired on the spot. He said, what shift do you wanna work? I said, what are, you, what are you asking me for, man? You're the boss, what do you need? I said, you're Batman, I'm Robin. You tell me what shift you need. He said, this is perfect, man. I need an opener. I said, man, I'd love to be your opener, man. I'd love to be your opener. What time you need me here? He said, be here tomorrow, 4.30 a.m. <laughs> on the outside, I was like, yeah, of course, of course. Inside, I'm like, like what? 4.30? Like, I don't mind getting up early, but 4.30? Like, God's not even up at 4.30. You think I'm kidding? Some of you have tried praying at 4.30. God's like, go back to bed. Hit me up at 6. Okay, hit me up at 7. Like, it's not time for that. Go to sleep. So I got up every day at 3.45. I drank a pot of coffee in Jesus' name. Prayed my way into work, praying, it, praying my way in, because, because I never thought of myself as the front desk guy. I was the pastor of the gym. 8,000 members, I had the biggest church in town day one. 8,000. So I drank a pot of coffee. How many of you know between caffeine and the Holy Ghost? Come on, some good things that happen in your life. Don't try to do one without the other, you need them both. And so I went to the front desk, and I, I just began to do ministry, frankly. I didn't tell people I was a Christian at first. I, I didn't tell people I was starting a church. I just began serving them, and, and God opened so many doors. It was some of the most fruitful, beautiful ministry I've ever done. It was great. I, I, would, um, uh, I led people to Jesus at the front desk. I did marriage counseling at the front desk. No, that's true. I, I was at the front. I'm making a smoothie, you know, for somebody. I'm scanning people in, and this guy's complaining about his wife. He doesn't even know I'm a Christian, much less a pastor. I'm standing there, and he's telling me about how uh, his marriage isn't good. And I said, hey, man, do you know about love languages? He's like, what are you talking about? I started telling him about words of affirmation and quality time. It's like speaking a language, and the reason, you know, that your wife won't physically touch you is because you're making her do all the work, and so if you'll just get in and serve her, man, she'll have her hands all over you. And he's like, he went and got his wife off of the elliptical machine and brought her to the front desk. <laughs> I, I'm, not, I'm not kidding. I'm making smoothie, counseling their marriage. When, when, when I left and I put in my two weeks to go full-time at the church, I did work the job for over a year. And when I went to go full-time at the church, I tell people, hey, you know, these are my friends, because I learned their names, by the way. I would do, what's your name, my man? 
Sean what? Sean Canole? Sean Canoles. Sean Canoles will come in the gym. I scan him. Sean Canoles. All right, man. Then I do drills because I want to learn his name. I want to memorize his name. You show somebody honor by learning their name. If, if everybody in your life is, oh, what's his name? Oh, I'm not good with names. We'll get good with names. I'm not good with names. I do drills. Sean Canoles. Sean Canoles. Sean Canoles. You know, how, how am I going to? How am I gonna remember this? You know, uh, for you know, take the forget the gun, leave the cannoli, or you know, what was that? <laughs> I'm gonna remember it. I'm gonna do drills, and then he goes, leave. Sean Canoles, have a good day, man. Where are you headed? Work. Cool, man. What do you do? We became friends. We started to build bonds and relationships. And I took interest in people, and I had a chance to pray with people. I had a chance to share Jesus with people. And so when I was going to leave to go full time to be a pastor. I told this, this lady's walking out, I call her by name. Hey, I'm, I, in two weeks, I won't be here at the front desk anymore, you know, because I'm, I'm taking another job. Oh, that was, oh, that's good, honey. That's so good. What are you, what are you doing? Oh, I'm, I'm going to be, I'm a pastor. She's like, I knew it. <laughs> she said, I knew it. I said, what? She said, I knew you were a Christian. I said, how'd you know? She goes, because you always talk nice about your wife. I was like, really, it's that easy? That's all you gotta do? Like talk nice about your wife? Like everybody's out there talking like their wife's the ball and chain and I give honor to my wife and people are like, something's weird about this guy. You know, Jesus called it salt and light. You know, we don't need to be worried about the darkness because we're light. It's a dark world out there. I know, man, we're in the flashlight business. Isn't it great? You turn on a light and the darkness has to back down. And, and, and so, you know, just by, just by being salt and light. I used to go so soft on people about the marketplace, you know. Oh, it's dark out there, guys. I know it's bad. It's horrible. It's, it's, it's evil. It's, it's, it's toxic is what it is. And, and, you know, we come in here and we can hunker down for a few hours. And hopefully we get enough in us that we can go and just maybe make it for six more days. Forget that. You're playing offense, man. You're, you're part of the mission of God. You're full of the spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives inside of you. And so wherever God has planted you, I think you should bloom there. I think you should go be salt and light in that place. And I just saw how effective, like they were trying to promote me up through the company from the front desk, you know. I was making minimum wage simply by just pastoring people, being kind to people, treating them with honor, actually listening to people, trying to help people. And so I just want to encourage you wherever God has planted you. I, I want to I uh, take you to a few verses, maybe some you've considered before, and I want us to look at them. You know, you, you remember those, um, uh, those, those pictures they used to have where if you look at it, it just looked, um, looked crazy, but if you relaxed your eyes, then the thing would pop out at you. You know what I'm talking about? Remember those? I don't think they still make them, but I used to love those things. And uh, I want us to do that with the scripture today. I'm going to take a few scriptures and bring them together, and maybe we relax our eyes and see something a little new and fresh uh, from, the, from the Bible. I want to start with the, the, the idea that I'm going to assume, I'm going to assume that everyone in this room is really, really, really trying to do your absolute best at all the responsibilities you have. Like if you're a mom or dad in the, in the house, I believe about you that you want to be great at it. I think that's where probably mommy guilt, dad guilt comes from because you just want to get it right so bad and you're just worried you're not doing it good. And, and so you always, it's like whack-a-mole, you know, you get this thing right and then this other thing pops up and I just can't keep up and I just feel bad. And nobody wants their kids to grow up, you know, with all kinds of baggage. But you know you're not perfect, but you're like, man, you know, what, what if on accident I mess these kids up, you know? Because, I mean, you know, regret is um, if I knew then what I know now, I'd do it different. But you got to cut yourself some slack because if you knew then what you knew then, you'd do the same thing. So we're trying to do the best we can. You're trying to do the best you can on the job, you're trying to do the best you can in your business. If you, lead, if you lead a third grade class, you're trying to steward that opportunity well. If you have people that work for you, you own a business, you're trying to do it right. And what I believe about your church and, and, and my church is that we're trying to do this right. Because what are we? We're, we're the body of Christ, the body of Jesus. Jesus doesn't physically live on the earth anymore. He ascended to heaven, but he sent the Holy Spirit. Think of some scripture. Jesus says, hey, it's better for you if I leave. What? It's better for you if I leave because I'm gonna send the Spirit. And the Holy Spirit now will fill all of you and you'll be able to go everywhere. Jesus stayed in a very small radius, you know. That's how, that's how, that's how we can even make sense of, you'll do greater things than I've done. 
Jesus says. It's like, what does that mean? What does that even mean? Because how are you going to go toe-to-toe with Jesus in, in a quality competition? Man walked on water, he raised the dead. You can't do that. It, it's really a quantity is what he's saying. You're going to go places I didn't go. You're going to go, Jesus didn't go to surprise Arizona. You, you're here. So he's like, it's better. I'm going to send the spirit that raised me from the dead to live in you, and then you guys are going to be the body of Jesus. We want to do this right, don't we? How do we do it right? Okay, let's, let's, I want to start, actually, I'm going to summarize the first part of it because I'm going to read the second part, and I don't want to just read too much, otherwise I'm going to lose, lose you, okay? But here, here's, what, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to summarize Mark 11. Mark 11, there's two stories. I want to tell them in tandem because they're, they're written by Mark in tandem, so one right after another. Usually, we don't uh, teach them in sequence. We teach them separately, but together, it kind of, I think, creates some tension. First part. Jesus curses a fig tree that's not making figs, okay? So the scripture says in Mark 11, Jesus is hungry, okay? I would say, it doesn't use this word, but I would say Jesus was hangry. Anybody been there? <laughs> it's just like, man, just give me a snack, I'll be fine, okay? So by the way, when you're hangry, don't talk, just be quiet. Eat, because everything you say you're gonna regret in about 30 minutes. So Jesus, you know, is walking, he's hangry, he's hungry, And he goes to this fig tree, and the fig tree didn't have any figs, and Jesus curses the fig tree. And he he says, may you never bear fruit again. And the disciples, like, overheard it. They're like, whoa. And, And they come back later in 24 hours, the fig tree's dead. It's withered up and died. (laughs) Okay, well, what's the point of that? Well, I think Jesus clearly is making a point that he expects us to be fruitful, in the way that he designed us. Jesus didn't curse the fig tree because it didn't make oranges. He didn't curse the fig tree because it didn't make apples because it's not an apple tree. It's a fig tree. But you're a fig tree, doggone it. I expect you to make figs. Okay? So he, so he curses the fig tree with no figs. Well, then he goes from there into a very familiar portion when he goes and cleans out the temple. Remember this? He comes in, he makes a whip. He's flipping over temple tables. He's like, what's wrong with you guys? You've made this into a den of thieves. This is a house of robbers. It's supposed to be a house of prayer. This is my father's house. This is a holy place. And you've turned it into a den of thieves. When you put them together and you imagine being Peter or John or James, like one of these guys, you'd have to be sort of wrestling with what is Jesus one of me? Because in a sense, he gets upside the fig tree's head for not bearing fruit, but then you got all these people in the temple trying to be productive. They're trying to, they're, they're, they're trying to actually, they're selling things and they're doing things, and Jesus, you know, isn't cool with that. At some point, their fruitfulness became mercenary. And so the disciples are trying to figure out, well, what, what does this mean for us? Um, I want to take you to a parable Jesus shares in, in uh, Luke 16. I'm going to read it in the, I'm going to go back and forth between the message translation, which is a little more free verse, true to the spirit of the text, but free verse. And then I'm going to go into the NLT because I want us to get the whole weight of, of this text. Verse one, Luke 16, one, Jesus said to his disciples, there was once a rich man who had a manager, when it says he had a manager, it doesn't mean he reported to a manager. It meant the, re- the manager reported to him. It said he got reports that this manager was shady. He had been taken advantage of his position by running up huge personal expenses on the company's dime. And so he called him in and he said, what's this I hear about you? You're fired and I want a complete audit of your books. And the manager said to himself, well, what am I going to do? This isn't good. I've lost my job as manager and I'm not strong enough for a laboring job and I'm too proud to beg. Ah, I've got a plan. Okay, so what does he do? One after another, he calls the people who were in debt to his master. And he said to the first, how much do you owe? And he replied, a hundred jugs of olive oil. The manager said, here, here, take the bill. Take it, take it. Hey, sit down there. Quick, quick, write 50. Gives them a 50% discount. What are they going to do, fire me? I already got fired. He's making friends on his way out. Verse 7, to the next he said, and you, what do you owe? He answered, 100 sacks of wheat. He said, here, take, take, take your bill, right, right 80. Gives him 20% off. 
Okay, if you're reading this, you know, and you know Jesus well, you're anticipating the next part of the story, and what you expect is this, this uh, shady, dishonest, like, like a trap door to hell is gonna open up and swallow this dude up. That's what you're expecting. You're like, man, Jesus is about to go off. You know, a few chapters later, he's gonna tell the parable of the talents. Talents, didn't, they didn't hear talents like we hear talents. We hear talents, we think like gifts or skills. When they heard talents, they heard a weight. So it was actually money. And so Jesus says, hey, there was this one guy, and he makes up another story. There was one guy who had like $5 million, and another guy had like $2 million, the other guy had $1 million. He gave it to him, and he said, I'm gonna go away, I'm gonna come back, do well with my money. One guy went from five to 10, other guy two to four, and the guy with one just buried it, hid the money in the ground, and it, Jesus comes back and goes hard on the guy who didn't, he didn't give anybody 50% off, he didn't give anybody 20% off, he didn't do anything, he just hid the money, so it was the exact same amount of money. And he comes back, and what he says to him is, you wicked, lazy servant. And he takes the money from him, and he gives it to the guy with 10 well, if he would do that to the guy who didn't steal a dime, but he just hid it in the ground, what's he gonna do to this guy who's given 50% off on his way out after he got fired? Well, he's cleaning out his desk. Whew, it's about to get real. <laughs> Verse eight, now here's a surprise. The master praised the crooked manager. <laughs> what in the name of Enron's going on here? In the name of Bernie Madoff, what's going on? Praise the, by the way, this is Jesus talking. You don't hear a lot of sermons on this. Luke 16, he praised the crooked manager, and why? That's what I'm wondering. Streetwise people are smarter in this regard than law-abiding citizens. They're on constant alert, looking for angles, surviving by their wits, he says, I want you to be smart in the same way. Now watch this. But here's how I want you to be different. I want you to be on constant alert, looking for angles, surviving by your wits, but for what is right. Using every adversity to stimulate you to creative survival, to concentrate your attention on the bare essentials, and you'll live, really live, not complacently, just to get by on good behavior. Look how, look how it reads in Luke 16, 8, in the NLT, New Living Translation. The rich man had to admire the dishonest rascal for being so shrewd. And it is true that, look at this now, the children of this world are more shrewd in dealing with the world around them than are the children of light, of the light. So Jesus is telling a story, and it's kind of a provocative story. It kind of, you have a visceral reaction I'll be honest, it's one I kind of want to just read past because I don't like to put up any, sh any shady person. But what Jesus is doing is showing, hey, this guy, this guy played the angle. This guy had a strategy. This guy had a plan. This guy was really serious about it. He said, now, do the same thing he did. You should be just as shrewd. You should be just actually more strategic. You should be more. He said, do it, but don't, don't be shady. You can be shrewd, and sincere. Be shrewd, be strategic, but do it in the right way for the right reason. I want you to think about this. Sometimes we gotta say this stuff out loud that we know or we believe, but really, I want you to really think about this. I'm gonna give you a sort of a cliff note um, of, the, of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was present in Genesis 1 at the creation, God created the heavens and the earth. There was no heaven, there was no earth. He creates the sky, the earth, the out, outer space, everything. He creates it, the Holy Spirit was there, the ultimate creative being. And creates something so amazing, we're still trying to figure it out. Like all the gajillion light years, and, and you know all of outer space and all this, we don't even know what all's out there, I mean it's crazy. But even the earth, like we're still trying to discover the earth. We're trying to figure stuff. There, there's like, you know, 90% of the ocean is undiscovered. You know, we've been here all these years and we, we haven't discovered. There's all these mysteries and microbiology. So the macro, the micro, 
the Holy Spirit, the ultimate creative being, was present at that creation. The same Spirit, that same Holy Spirit, filled prophets, priests, and kings throughout the Old Testament, gave them divine insight, gave them the ability to foresee and anticipate things hundreds of years in advance that they could have never seen in their own ability. Gave them a supernatural anticipation. That same spirit, Paul says in Romans, raised Christ from the dead. The spirit, the same one, there's not a different Holy Spirit. Genesis at the creation of the world, prophets, priests, and kings, Jesus raised them from the dead. That same spirit filled the the apostles in the book of Acts, caused the gospel of Jesus Christ to proliferate to the ends of the earth and has made his way to us. That same spirit, Paul says, lives in you. Do you believe that? Seriously. You need to find a way to keep that reality in front of yourself every day. Because if that in fact is true, then why would we ever be a step or two or three behind the world? Why would we ever be a step? Why would we be less strategic? We think about the power of the Holy Spirit. We tend to to limit the power of the Holy Spirit to this context. You know, I'm going to church on Sunday, you know, 1045. We're going to have church. We're going to sing worship. We're going to hear the word. I really hope the Holy Spirit moves. I do too. But I also hope the Holy Spirit moves in your boardroom. I hope the Holy Spirit moves when you're working on the project on your computer. I hope the Holy Spirit shows up in your planning session. I hope the Holy Spirit shows up in your execution. I hope the Holy Spirit shows up in your third grade class. I hope the Holy Spirit shows up as you're coaching ball. I hope the Holy Spirit shows up as you're playing quarterback. I hope the Holy Spirit shows up as you're leading the neighborhood watch, as you're head of the association, as you're on the parent teacher, uh, the parent teacher conference. I, I, hope, I, hope all, I hope the Holy Spirit shows up there too. We, we tend to limit to here, but do you believe the spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you? So Jesus says this later in the book of Matthew, he says um, in verse uh, 10, chapter 10, 16, he said, I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves, so be shrewd as snakes and harmless as doves. Shrewd as snakes, harmless as doves. I want you to be shrewd. Be more shrewd than the guys making the apps. Be more shrewd. The greatest ideas shouldn't come out of Silicon Valley to just make something that will pass away, moth and rust will destroy. It should be coming out of the body of Christ. It should be coming out of us. And we should be strategic. It's not unspiritual to be strategic. He said, be shrewd as a snake, harmless as a dove. Let's real quick backtrack to what we talked about in Mark 11 when Jesus goes in the temple and he starts cleaning the thing out. Okay? Uh, Why is he doing that? Well, think about this now. Think about what Jesus was here to do. Jesus shows up in a context where the temple, when they thought of the temple, they thought of this. They thought of a building, the temple, right? Um, I, I'll, go, I'll go quick here. Hang with me, though. If, if you go, like, 200 years before Jesus showed up in the world, there was a huge event that would actually, we would know as Hanukkah. And it was actually um, the Seleucids, Antiochus, took the, the statue of Zeus and put it in the temple, the Jewish temple, To the Jewish people, the temple was the holiest place in the world, right? No one can go into the Holy of Holies except one guy after a thorough cleansing ritual once a year. This is the holiest place in the world. And so Antiochus, in order to try to break the Jewish people, he tried to crush their culture because he thought they'd be easier to rule. So he puts a statue of Zeus right in the middle of the temple. Well, what happens? The Maccabees, Judas Maccabeus, Judas the Hammer, what a nickname, Judas the Hammer, raises up as a revolutionary, guerrilla warfare. They fight, they go in, they boot Zeus out of the temple and they take the temple back. So in their mind, the temple was a building. It was, it was an actual geographic location. When Jesus comes to the world, he says, you can tear the temple down, I'll rebuild it in three days. And what he was doing essentially was not only foreshadowing his death and resurrection, but he was foreshadowing the new covenant and the way Paul articulates it is this, know ye not, ye are the temple. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So wherever you go, the temple's there. The temple's there. 
when Jesus went in to clean out the temple, he's cleaning out a physical building, but the bigger picture is, it's actually we are the temple, which means when the Holy Spirit shows up in our hearts, he wants to clean us out. So really what it gets down to is strategies aren't bad or good. They're not evil. People, though, can have evil hearts. And we have temples that need flipped over. And we need some things that need driven out of our hearts. So as we're looking like, how does Radiant Church, how do we do this thing that we so want to do? We wanna do this well. We wanna do this under the influence of the Holy Spirit. We wanna be more strategic. We wanna be out front. But we don't wanna become the type of church or the type of people that Jesus feels a need to show up to with whips and flipping stuff over. We wanna be shrewd but sincere. We don't wanna be mercenary. It's allowing each individual, each of you and me, to allow the Holy Spirit to come in and search my heart and flip over whatever temple he wants to in this temple. And then from there to purify the temple so that now we can be shrewd as snakes, harmless as doves. When, a few years ago, I took a mission trip to the nation of Haiti. And we were there working with uh, some organizations that were incredibly strategic. They wanted to... to bring a, a, you know, healing and health to Haiti. So they were like, how are we gonna do it? Well, we wanna do it by improving the educational system within the country so that the young people can go get a better education than they've ever had, than we, we, we've ever had, so that they'll gr grow up and be able to build infrastructure and be able to, to make changes within their own country. Well, how'd you get kids to go to school? A lot of the kids weren't going to school because they needed a meal, they were hungry. And so instead of going to school because they couldn't get food, they would just go get food, but they didn't get educated. So they worked with organizations that said, we're going to strategically put food at school. If you're hungry, come to school, get food. Kids would go to school to get food and then get educated. And so it's a strategy. We're gonna get them, we're gonna use food to get them here and then we're gonna train them and then, and then they're gonna change the nation, okay? Strategic. While I was there, I was working with that organization and I met some people part of a different organization, a different thing, and they were working in human trafficking or anti-human trafficking. And so, so I, I sat down uh, for dinner and I was speaking because I didn't really know much about their work and it was amazing to listen. And I'm not gonna go all into the strategy, but it was incredibly strategic. But what they said to me is this, they explained to me the strategy that, that, that the human traffickers have. They, they don't just walk out with no plan. They are tremendously strategic in the way that they lure in women. And they're tremendously strategic in the way that they lure in men and the way that they traffic. It is like a really organized with systems and processes and onboarding. And I mean, it's like a big, okay. And so, so now these anti-traffickers, she, she sat across from me and she told me her strategy. I thought about it. I'm thinking, you know, if the pimp has a strategy, you better have a better one. If the enemy has a strategy, you better have a better one. If, if the porn site has a strategy, the church better have a better one. We, we, we can't just go out there and, and hope and cross our fingers and toes and sing kumbaya and hope everything's gonna go good. I sat and listened, and this lady was outfoxing the traffickers. So the anti-trafficker has to have a better strategy and a better plan than the trafficker. Shrewd as snake, harmless as dove. And friend, I wanna just call us to thinking bigger, to, think, to realizing like, when you look yourself in the mirror, you've got to see a person full of the spirit that raised Christ from the dead. That's who you are. That's who you are. So, so instead of uh, you know, being three steps behind, we need to pray that the Lord would help us to th see three or four steps ahead, that the world would be showing up trying to figure us out because that's what we are. We're the body of Christ. Okay, so what does this look like? Let's think, like, what, what is a church, the body of Christ? What's it supposed to look like? Well, let's simplify it. Let's not get too complicated. Let's, over, let's not overthink it. Think of it like this. What do we do? We come together in unity. Jesus says, by this, the whole world will know you're my disciples, that you love one another. So a unified church is the greatest testimony to the world that we can have. A disunified church is probably the worst testimony we can have. There's plenty of polarization out there. They don't need us to model that. In fact, we can be a freak of nature in the world that they go, you know, pretty much everywhere else turns very monolithic very quickly. 
Everybody violently agrees. In fact, that's, I think it's been one of the things that's caused the, the church to not be as effective in the world is that often um, we don't get along, and so they look and they're just like, oh, well, you know, what's different about you? Like imagine being able to come to a worship service, to come to this place and to be able to worship next to somebody of a different generation, of a different culture, somebody that's very different than you, maybe votes different. You, you do know there's people in this room who voted for people you hate. Or I'm not hate, because we're Christians, we're, we're too classy for that. Um, <laughs> someone you didn't want to win, we'll say that. Okay, and vice versa. And so, so like, the idea that people would look and go, man, these guys are incredibly unified. Je Jesus prayed, his, 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 the high priestly prayer before he goes to the cross, Father, I pray that they may be one as we are one. He said, so that the world will know you sent me. It's an incredible testimony. So we come together in unity, in unity, and we unify, and we serve each other. We take joy, as Paul says, take joy in honoring one another. We're not dragging each other down, we're building each other up. Okay, I mean, seriously, the community of this church should be so good that atheists come in here like, I don't even believe in God, but these are the best people, man. They, they really build you up, you know? They build you up. They see stuff in you you don't see in yourself, you know? They're eager to serve one another, man. It's just, it's, it's pretty crazy, you know? I don't believe their stuff, but man, I wanna be there, man. This is a great community. So, so by this, they'll, you'll know, they'll know you're my disciples. So unity, we come together, we serve each other, and then what do we do? We lift up the name of Jesus. We honor him. We put him in his rightful place. We listen to his word. We listen to the word of God. And the Holy Spirit speaks to us about us. And then we, we now are ourselves under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And then we go into the world and we take that every single place we go. I was talking to a guy recently, we, we were having breakfast and he was like, uh, he's in his mid fifties and um, he's, been, he's always been into exercise and fitness and everything and, and he, he, um, he said, Greg, I go to work out at the gym and I go to exercise, he goes, I walk in and it's like this beautifully diverse place but everyone's got their AirPods and no one's talking to anybody. He's like, so I just decided I'm gonna start talking to people. So he just starts walking up and just talk, like talking to people and they're like, why are you talking to me? And, and, and so he would talk to them and he begins making friends. He goes, it's crazy, man. He goes, they, people start sharing their life with me. People start sharing, their, they start telling me about their pain. And he, he goes, they, they didn't even know. And I said, my man, you're pastoring the gym. And he goes, what? I said, you're pastoring the gym. He asked me later, he goes, hey man, I'd like to do more you know, get more involved in the church. I'm like, that's fine. We'll, I'll give you some stuff you can do. But listen, I don't want to get you so busy at the church that you can't pastor your gym, that you can't pastor your church. What's the greatest community outreach? Well, build a great church, come together in unity, worship God, hear his word, let the Holy Spirit speak to you. But the greatest outreach is for you to go coach ball. It's for you to go be involved in the community. It's for you, under the influence of the Holy Spirit, to go lead like Jesus, not to be served, but to serve, to lift others up, to be that kind of leader at your business and everything you do, that's community outreach. Man, we can hand out bottles of water at the parade with the church logo on it, and that's fine, that's cool, let's do that. But a better outreach would be you getting involved in your community under the influence of the Holy Spirit, under the influence of the Holy Spirit. In a moment, you're about to see a video of some changed lives in the church. I saw this last service, and I'm, I mean, incredible, great work. This church is doing amazing work. You know, we live in a great time because I had never been to this church till today, but I've known about this church for a long time. And I, I go online and I see the things you guys are doing and it encourages me and inspires me. I stay connected to it and I see the fruit, but all the fruit that's, that, that's come to this church, it hadn't the, is the best fruit is yet to come. You still got work to do. And what it's gonna take is everybody doing their part. I end with this. This really is my ending, I, I promise you. This is the last thing. That's how preachers lie, by the way. They're like, no, this is my final thought. I'm gonna give you a, the, my family, the Ford family motto, okay? We're a family of five. I have three kids. Uh, my oldest is a da my daughter. She's 14. Her name's Ella. She's amazing. We're like this, super tight, super tight. Um, I've never, I don't even think I've been mad at her yet. I, I don't think she sinned, actually. She's 14. 
I know all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God technically, but I don't think it's happened yet. I mean, she's, she's a brilliant kid. Um, then I have two sons. Hudson's 11, Miles is eight. Both of my boys are on the autism spectrum. So my daughter has a WEP, exceptional student. Both of my boys have major severe learning delays. And so we're like, man, how do we define success as a family? Well, we define success as a family with each individual defines it differently. So here's our family motto. Do your part, do your best. Nothing more, nothing less. My daughter, we challenge her. We encourage her to do great things, you know, whatever. My son Hudson, uh, last year he got kicked off the bus because he didn't follow the rules. He had meltdowns and he wouldn't sit in his seat, so they kicked him off the bus. And they would only let him back on if he would wear a harness. So they harness him into his seat. And he says a lot of bad words. He learned it from my wife. She has a foul mouth. So they say, <laughs> pray for her, guys, pray for her. Pastor's wife, mouth like a sailor, you know. And so my son learned all those words, and once he realized he wasn't supposed to say them, all he wanted to do was say them. Last week, he won Bus Rider of the Day. Someday, we're believing for Bus Rider of the Week. It may take a while. But right now we're celebrating bus rider of the day. Do your part, do your best, nothing more, nothing less. Some of you were programmed by God to be shrewd. You've always been shrewd. You've always been strategic. You've always been competitive. You've always wanted to win. And what he wants to do is bring a heart that's harmless as a dove. Because if all you are is shrewd as a snake, you become a self-absorbed, narcissistic consumer. He doesn't want that for your life. He wants to add the harmless as a dove heart. Some of you are harmless as a dove. In fact, it scares you when the church grows. It scares you when we play offense and plant another campus because we don't just want to see people as numbers. We want to see that everybody's taken care of. They're, this really is the body of Christ. You've got a heart of gold. You got a heart of gold. That's why God brought you here. He brought you here to make sure that no, that, that, that every single number has a name and every name has a story like you're about to see and that you're part of making sure this really is the body of Christ. Not just a form of godliness, it really is a move of God and you're a part of that. But don't be afraid of strategy and don't be afraid of playing offense and don't be afraid of playing aggressive. This is what God is bringing together. Whatever your part is in giving your time, your energy, your money, your heart, your attitude, your body, yourself. Be generous, not just with your stuff, be generous with yourself. And what you do in the process, if all this beautiful body of Christ will come together, everybody do your part, do your best, nothing more, nothing less. Watch what God will do, amen? Let's pray together. Lord, we come to you in the name that's above all names, the name of Jesus, the name of Jesus. Lord, we sense you here today provoking our hearts and speaking right to each one of us. Lord, we thank you for the collective word that's gone out to the whole church, but I thank you for the custom word you're speaking to each individual. Give us the courage, Lord, to walk in your truth and to walk in obedience. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. All God's people said amen. amen.